Well, welcome to the show today. I hope and pray that you're really going to enjoy it and it's going to make a difference in your life. You know, I want to start out by just simply saying, you know, God is not mad at you. And you might think, well, of course he's mad at me. I've done some really bad things. Well, you know what? He may not like everything you do, but he does love you. And he wants to love you into wholeness and he wants to heal you and make you the kind of person that he knows that you can be. And so I really believe if you want to change that developing a healthy relationship with God is the way to do that. And Pastor Paul Scanlon joins me again today to discuss the difference between religion and relationship. Well, Paul, thanks again for being here all the way from, from merry old England. We thanks always call you. it merry old England as it is merry as people uh, like to think it is. In parts it's merry, in some <laughs> parts it's not so merry. We're in the merry part. You're in the merry part. <laughs> How does just having a religious attitude, what does it do to you? Uh, how, how does it affect you? Well, let, let, me, let me give you an example of, of something that I saw recently that I, that I think just depicts religion mm. to the max. I was talking with somebody and over a period of about three weeks. I discovered that they were married but separated, had a girlfriend who also was a missionary, mm. which I'm already going, okay, she's a missionary, but she knows you're married. Yeah. And then the person was telling me what they were giving up for Lent. So I'm thinking, now here we have a person <laughs> who's following this religious form, yeah. a rule that they learned to always give up something for Lent, and yet they're living a very unrighteous life, yeah. not making <laughs> right decisions at all. Yeah. What does religion do to us? <laughs> that, that is a great picture of religion because it's like Jesus said to the Pharisees, you, you, you will tithe to the nth degree counting the leaves off the mint bush in the garden to make sure you only take 10% of the foliage. You'll cross the world, he said, to make a convert, but you won't lift a finger to help people that are living under the burden of an oppressed life he said, it's right that you are trying to do right by God in these things. But he said, what really matters is love and justice, which religion never sees, love and justice. That is exactly what religion does. It allows us to believe that we are right with God when actually our heart is not even engaging God. And it can allow us to do that for decades, and we never know yep. that we are not the real deal. I think that's the, 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 the subtlety and the deception of religion that allows people to believe that they have a relationship with God because they have a relationship with stuff that's to do with God. So we can have a relationship with God's stuff, but not know God. And, and, and within that describes millions of people across the world. Following the rules and the regulations, but not really having a heart after God, not really pursuing God with your lifestyle. Right. You know, I, t I, I like to explain to people that, you know, becoming a Christian takes place when you make that decision that you're going to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you're going to believe what the Bible says about Him, that right. He died for your sins, took your punishment, went to hell, rose from the dead, right. and that He's alive today. Yeah. You legally become a Christian when you make that decision, <laughs> but for that to be worked out in your life, yeah. You have to let God change you. Right. He, you know, he's come into your heart, but now he wants to work something in you and then through you, right. which requires you being willing to become that brand new creature that the Bible says that you can become. When right. you become a Christian, it doesn't just mean, well, now, you know, I go to church every Sunday and I read a chapter in my Bible every day right. and I repeat the Lord's Prayer three times <laughs> a day and now I'm okay because I'm going to yeah. go to heaven when I die. That, that's yeah. not really what Christianity is all about. Christianity is yeah. about living for God, yeah. a vibrant, exciting life exactly. that's birthed out of relationship with Him. I've, I've always been amazed in Mark 5 where it said when Jesus chose the 12 apostles. It's a little phrase. It says He chose them to be with Him, which is a relational reason for choosing that's people. Good. He didn't choose them to work for Him or to be available to Him or to handle the crowds, but He chose them to be with Him. Uh, and that's the essence, I believe, of what God's still after with humanity. He chose them for relationship and for interaction and for fun and for doing life. I don't think they understood how much he wanted to be with them and how much he wanted them to be with him. I think they struggled to get it and various conversations he had with them helped you to realize 
they were more religiously trying to relate to him often than they were relationally trying to be with him. And Jesus would often diffuse the situation, move it away from this mystical religious mindset often they had to help them see, I have come to build a relationship with you guys. I don't want the apostles of the future church to miss the whole idea is that you guys have an essential relationship with me that is what makes you tick. I can't have you, Peter, in charge of the new church that's going to be born at Pentecost and you creating a religious institution after Pentecost. You've got to realize, and we've got three years for you to get this, guys. I chose you <laughs> to be with me. And the great privilege they had to do life with him, to know what his favorite color was, to know what his favorite food was, to know what his favorite clothes were, to know his favorite hobbies and interests and pastimes. He wanted them to be part of all that with him and not treat him as a religious figure and a religious icon. Now, what we've done in church history is, of course, we've forgotten that, and we say he hasn't chosen us to be with him. After all, what would God want from me? How could God enjoy me, a person like me? And so we keep him at a distance. We relate to him by being religiously, you know, word perfect and step perfect. And God's saying, I just want to be with people. I love people. The best idea God ever had was I people. really like Hebrews <laughs> 4, 15, and 16 that says that we have a high priest who understands our weaknesses. Beautiful. Exactly. That, I mean, how comforting is that? First of all, who doesn't want to be understood? Yeah. You know, especially as a woman, you know, we just want people to understand. I tell Dave all the time, even if you don't, tell me you do, because it makes me feel better. Yeah. But to yeah. think that we have a high priest, a perfect Savior, who understands our weaknesses and our infirmities, yeah. because he's been tempted just like we were, yet he never sinned. Yeah. And then verse 16 says, therefore, let us come boldly, boldly, right. <laughs> to the throne of grace, right. that you might receive the help that you need yes. in plenty of time. To meet your need and how many people because of the way they feel about themselves or the way they think God feels about them right they don't even pray and ask God for what they really want or need because they don't think they have a right to and even if they do right it's an apology more than it is a prayer yeah, yeah. and God wants us to learn how to receive his mercy yeah now, I, I think to uh, my take on the 21st century world Joyce is that it is a relational world, essentially. People want relationship, and Hollywood churns out movies about relationship. People write books about relationship. People go on TV all the time talking about their whole world. Is relationship dependent? It's either relationally blessed or relationally dysfunctional. And I think the 21st century unchurched world, the last thing they're looking for is religion. Maybe generations ago, people would find some comfort in religion, but not anymore, not in 21st century world where so many people are suffering loneliness and are suffering uh, for the lack of good relationship and friendship and closeness and intimacy with each other. And I think if we portray God as an institution, as an organization, right. as a set of rules and regulations, we're not even understanding the kind of world we are trying to reach. It's a relational world. And God is a father, and he has a family. All the terms about him are of a person that's relational, that's into people, that wants to have a relationship with humanity. So we're even shooting ourselves in the foot as the church when we portray him as a set of rules and regulations right. and a set of thou shalts and thou shalt nots. Because essentially what we're finding in our community in the United Kingdom People want relationship, but they just don't believe it's possible to have a relationship with God. Now, we certainly, you know, aren't trying to be, you know, portray in these programs that we don't need to seek to do what's right, because we do. Sure. But the whole point is, is when you have relationship with God through Christ, then you have a desire to yes. do what's right. Yes. And you end up doing what's right because you really want to. Yes. Not because you think... You have to. Right. I didn't get that for years. I was doing more and trying harder, but becoming less and less as a person. Until I realized that God wants me to develop who I am as a person, which I can't do in relationship with stuff and with adherence out of duty to things. I used to think if I read more scripture than less scripture, it would somehow have virtue and gain me points with God right. uh, and the same with many things in my life that were driven by this need to please God 
instead of just building a relationship with him, and I believe, and I've discovered, life responds actually to who you are. It, it doesn't respond to what you do. And all across the world, people are trying to get life to respond to them and get opportunities to come their way and get people to like them by doing things that they perceive will get that effect. Instead of just being who you are and developing who you are as a person, and it's a lot of fun when you discover that secret, which was a secret hidden by religion from me, that God's interested in developing you as a person. And when you are, when you are the right person, instead of trying to do the right things as the wrong person, when you become the right person God intended you to be, a lot of the things we try to fix kind of automatically seem to come right, as opposed to I'm always yeah, trying to exactly tinker with right. the engine and get this perfect. I've discovered if you'll concentrate on just being the right person, growing a great life, growing a great relationship with God, I, I had a great marriage without trying to fix it all the time, a great relationship with my kids, without trying to be, by doing things for my kids, yeah. a great father. I discovered that came as a byproduct of relationship with God as opposed to something I fixed separate to Him. Well, Hebrews 12 says, looking away from all that will distract unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of your faith. And I think that, that Satan really is the author of our distractions right. more than our destructions right. even. And he wants, he wants to distract us. And one of the ways that he does it is by getting us to constantly be looking at everything that's wrong with us yes. and concentrating on everything that God probably is mad about and doesn't like. And then all those things that we think about actually drive a wedge between us and God and we feel like then that we can't go to Him. Right. And here He is saying, I've already taken care of all that. I knew everything you were going to do wrong. I've already provided a perfect sacrifice for you. All you need to do is repent, genuinely be sorry, want to do better, and come on, let's have relationship. Right. Because the more we focus on Him, the more we are going to be like Him. Well, we're going we're gonna to yeah, take a, a short break and then we're going to come back. You know, I struggled to change my attitude for years, like many of you have. And I just got more frustrated until I began spending quality time with God. Listen to what I told the people that they should do at my Detroit conference, and we'll be back. You probably go through some of the stuff I used to. You go to sit down and have your fellowship time with God, and your heart wants to get your book. But your legalistic side says, no, you have to read the Bible first. <laughs> Come on, tell me if I'm not, does that happen to you too? Okay. Even though the book has got the Bible in it, and I'm quoting scriptures on every page and doing nothing but talking about the Word, but giving an explanation to it, that legalistic mindset says if what you're reading is not between two leather covers that says Holy Bible on the outside of it, and so what happens to us is instead of following the Spirit and following what the anointing is on, we go with a law that we've got set up in our mind, and the Bible tells us plainly that law kills, but the Spirit makes alive. So then what happens is you don't enjoy your time with God because you're not following the leadership of the Holy Spirit, so there's no real anointing on it, and then that makes you not want to do it the next day because it's not something you enjoy. Now, I'm not telling you just to read books all the time and not read the Bible, but what I'm telling you is that God will lead you in different ways. Goodness sakes, if you can only do the same two things every time you spend time with God, anybody's going to get bored with that. God is creative. Some days I laugh, some days I cry, some days I listen to music, some days I write, some days I sit and stare out the window, occasionally I fall asleep. But I love God, and He knows that, and He knows your heart, too. Well, if you're just now joining us, we're talking about religion, our relationship, and my guest all the way from England is Pastor Paul Scanlon. While I know that you've had some real experiences in your own life from what you've been sharing with us about crossing over from just being a religious person to having a real vital relationship with God. And I know that your church has changed dramatically. Yeah. And the scripture that I'm thinking about is Matthew 9, 17, that says that you can't put new wine into an old wineskin. Mm. Now, you know, maybe there's people who've read that for years and don't have a clue what it's talking about, but I think that it means that you, you can't 
you can't pour new power into old methods and ways. Mm. You can't pour, you know, fresh life and, and, and just vitality and enthusiasm and zeal into somebody who's got a little bitty narrow religious mindset. What does that scripture mean to you? I think this, the structure has always been optional to me, and we have made the structure sacred and eternal, and it's not. And I think the people to whom Jesus said that, the Pharisees, who specialized in religion and legalism and control of people, that was the greatest thing they needed to hear. And all of us that I think get confused between the new wine and the vessel at any given time that that wine is in. You know, um, many churches are closing down, Joyce, all across the world. Thousands of them close down every single year across the world, particularly in our country. And these buildings become carpet warehouses or engineers' place, or in our case, mosques all across Europe that used to be churches and places of worship. I have no doubt that every one of those churches at some point in their history were relevant, were helping people and reaching people. Otherwise, how did they ever get to exist? But somewhere from their beginnings that were relevant and useful to people and God-centered, they became out of touch and irrelevant and lacked credibility anymore to be a viable church to continue. And I think it's because historically we still get confused between the structures inside which God may do something at different times and the wine that represents the life of the Spirit. And I know in our church we made that mistake. We would force people to serve the structure and we celebrated the structure, but we didn't celebrate people's lives and people's spontaneity and people's liberty. So if you weren't in the house group when you should be, we had people chasing you, asking where were you, why weren't you there? And while some of that was our expression of care, much of it was control, and we defined membership by attendance at different things, and your attendance was monitored and checked, and all of that was kind of making people serve the structure. So when we transitioned our church and crossed our church over to the new church we became, one of the things we did was just allow the life of the church to be organic, and we structured around where people went. Instead of making them serve our idea of how we should do church in wineskins that were past their sell-by date, we would just let the people make new choices and provide different opportunities for them to involve in. And our church now is about 175 different ministries. Wow. But a few years ago, I think we had maybe 20 because all the ministry inventions came from leadership and ministry people. And everybody had to fit into exactly. that. Exactly. So everybody was serving the few ideas we had to do ministry. When we liberated the church to be creative and empowered them to do life and ministry, all these ideas came out of people's hearts that were there all along. But the containment of religion said that you are not valuable enough, nor are you gifted enough or special enough. Or spiritual enough. Or spiritual or anointed enough to contribute to what we might do as a ministry in the church or a program or an event. When we got rid of that and released people to get out what's in your heart, all these things that were sitting in people were amazing. But religion doesn't let people get out what's in them. It says, here's what we want you to do. Here's what we want you to serve, which the Pharisees were destroying people with and Jesus addressed. And it's still widespread across the world. <laughs> you know, I think, and, and I'd like you to speak to this, we have such a hard time with change. Mm. You know, it's like we've made a lot of really positive changes here at Joyce Meyer Ministries. And initially it was hard for me. You know, it, I think it's okay if maybe you're the one that wants to make the change. Yeah. But when somebody else is saying, hey, we think we need to change this, and you're not really on board with that, yeah. it's really difficult. And, you know, some of our younger people, you know, my young son, he began to tell me that we needed to be a little more relevant to the younger generation. Right. And we needed to maybe change our packaging a little, not our message, right. not our morals. Right. You don't change the message of God. Right. You don't change your moral values. Mm. But I think religion gets too caught up about the packaging. Yes, it does. We get too caught up about whether or not the building has stained glass windows yes. or what kind of artifacts are in the building yes. or how we dress when yes. we go to church. Yep. You know, like you're sitting here on my worldwide TV program today with, with jeans and a, and a T-shirt on. Right. And... Uh, I mean, there would have been a day when I would have thought, no way. I mean, that's just, that's not going to happen. And my son said to me, do you really think yeah. that God anoints polyester more than denim? 
And, you know, it, it took some things like that to shock me into reality that I was just holding on to an old wineskin. Yeah, that's good. Wanting new wine, wanting new power, wanting freshness, yeah. you know, wanting to reach more people, wanting to help more people, right. but not being willing right. to let go right. of my ways. And I think when I've touched things in the church over the years and changed certain things, I have been shocked at the riot almost reaction to changing things that to people I didn't know, to people were special and sacred, and those things for them made church what it is and made God who he is to them. So if we change the music style, put a guitar up there, change the way we do media, appointed young people to the staff, war right. denim, what's happening to our church? About which God's going, hello, I don't even <laughs> care. I'm still here. I'm not scared by your denim. I mean, I said to people, I got a letter recently from somebody in Europe, Joyce, that said to me, you are the scruffiest pastor on TV. It's a disgrace that you wear jeans on TV and you wear leather jackets on TV and you're a disgrace and all this letter that came. And I, I read it to my church for fun and we all laughed because I wanted to say to that lady, you should be glad you weren't in John the Baptist Church. Yeah. <laughs> I thought about that one day. You know, I was thinking about how judgmental I was towards the way some people dress. Mm. And then I thought about what Moses looked like yeah. when, when he went up to get the Ten Commandments yeah. and came back down. Yeah. And, you know, we don't, we don't think about that stuff. You know, we get so stuck in our own yeah. ideas That's right. of the way things should be. And I was just thinking about, you know, the heart of God is that we worship him. Yes. He doesn't particularly care if we do it with a harp. Yeah, right. Or an organ. Right. Or a guitar or yeah. a set of drums. Yeah. It's the heart of worship yes. that he's after. Yes. And I think that, that what we do is we trade this living vital relationship yeah, that God's after. That's right. For all this form of yes. religion. Yes. And we really get stuck there. Yes. And I really hope and pray that these programs are helping somebody to understand yeah, me too. That, it, that it's not about the outward form. Right. And we, we're not discounting all that and saying that it's not important, you know, that you dress nice when you go to church, but dressing sure. nice, really. Sure. I mean, you know, my son said to me, he said, you don't realize that this is nice to us. Yes, exactly. You know, he said, we're clean. Yeah. It's not the same material that you wore. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> this is nice. And we have to realize that it's the heart of the matter. And I said to people, I may be scruffy, but I'm designer scruffy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and you look more like you than you did in that suit you showed up with but earlier. But at least I brought a suit for you, But Joyce. you brought one for me. Thank so you. So that, that's good. Well, hey, we've enjoyed having you <laughs> on the you. program, and it's we hope fun. to do it again. Thank you.